Here's the news from the AP. Donald Trump's been impeached uh, after Capitol riot in historic second charge. Again, they say President Donald Trump was impeached by the U.S. House for a historic second time Wednesday, charged with incitement of insurrection over the deadly mob siege in the Capitol in a swift and stunning collapse of his final days in office. We get it. Several Republicans actually joined in. There were 10. That's kind of surprising, but not too surprising. Interestingly, we heard that Mitch McConnell was, would not be calling a special session of the Senate, which means the actual trial for Donald Trump will, have to, will happen after Biden is already pres- president. But you need to understand there is one thing they are doing here. Before I tell you what that one thing is, I'll note, Donald Trump put out a big statement today on video, on YouTube, for the White House, saying no violence and no law breaking. And if you look back at what Donald Trump said in D.C., he said, peacefully protest, peacefully march to cheer on politicians. He didn't tell anybody to do anything direct or to storm the Capitol or any of that stuff. But that's not what's important. The Democrats are levying a charge of incitement of insurrection for one reason. If Trump is convicted for insurrection, that is grounds to prevent him from running in 2024. That's what they're after. And that's why they are now trying to impeach him, even though, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, they did impeach him. That's why they're hoping to convict him even after he leaves office. So I've heard from a lot of people, they've said, it's too late. You'll never get a Senate trial in time. What's the point? There's many Republicans who are like, why is only eight days left? Because they don't want him to be able to have any political power ever again. And they want to do the same thing to all these other Republicans who supported Trump in the constitutional process of objecting to the vote. So I don't know what you guys think, but uh, I think it's doomed to fail unless you think they're Republicans who are actually going to, you know, they need 67 votes. I mean, uh, I mean, who knows? McConnell seems to really hate Trump right now. Uh, who knows where that will go? Uh, the question is, you know, is uh, is Trump like Trump like the uh, the Obi Wan Kenobi of getting impeached every time you do it, he gets stronger because <laughs> he does have this image of you know the one guy against everyone else, and this seems to bolster that image. Yeah, yeah. The if you strike me down, I'll become more possible, more powerful than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> that's the that's the bigger question beyond all of this, though. So I rolled my eyes when it's like, here we go with impeachment again, and they really dragged it out. It was like they announced, we're going to impeach Trump on Monday. And then on Monday, they were like, oh, here we go. But we're going to give Mike Pence 24 hours, 48 hours. We're going to impeach him on Wednesday. And then they finally do it. Didn't they need like nine months to decide that the (laughs) average citizen gets $600? But when it comes to impeachment, they could just do it like that. I mean, you know, this is a major thing, but I feel like it's losing its lackluster. It was such a major big deal with Bill Clinton when he was impeached. He still obviously was able to be president. But but now it's like, okay, we, we get the kind of larger symbolic gestures. And I feel like there's a lot of them that essentially don't really amount to a lot. What, the, the gestures? Well, the, the, the larger kind of uh, saying, you know, Trump's out, you know, trying to just to push anything Trump out. Like we saw the golf course. We saw New York City also announced today that they're right, getting right. that they're getting rid of any contracts they had with Trump, including uh, his property in the Bronx, including his ice skating ring in Central Park. So we're seeing just a lot of people using this situation to kind of stand on the grave of Donald Trump saying, look how good I am by dumping Trump. And that's crazy because Trump's popular still. Like the Trump supporters still love the man. Just because he's not, a pres- he's not president anymore doesn't mean they're going to sit by and just let these people destroy everything Trump. I think him getting banned made people love him. Like all, he got all this sympathy after he got banned off Twitter because the people were ready to start hating on him. And now all of a sudden. Well, you know what it is? I think surge. the Trump reply guys and these journalists on the left are sweating bullets. Like you're going to get laid off. Like Jim Acosta's already gone. You guys saw that, right? No, what happened? CNN announced that Jim Acosta is no longer the White House, you know, correspondent. Well, he served his purpose. <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. you, you can look at it that way, or you can just look at it as Jim Acosta was doing a job for CNN, but without Trump, he's literally nothing. The, it, it's, you, he served his purpose, I think. Sounds too nice. It's that Jim Acosta doesn't have anything going for him. The only thing he had was that he was the guy who was willing to waste everyone's time just blabbering at Trump and not ask, actually asking questions. Well, I'll be the first Breitbart reporter accused of being too nice to Jim Acosta. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, but it is. You served your pers- purpose and you can go. And I'm like, well, 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 he was useless from the get-go until Trump came in. <laughs> yes. No, for real. That's, that's better, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, w- w- did anyone know Jim Acosta before Trump? Nope. No, I mean, I I think I don't even know what he was doing for CNN. He was the White House press corps for a while. I remember meeting him um, 
oddly enough, at Bilderberg, but he wasn't covering Bilderberg. He was just staying at the Bilderberg Hotel before the actual conference was happening. Weird. And that's where I actually met him. And um, so, so what you're saying, yeah. he actually got fired. Um, if he was the White House correspondent before Trump, this was years and years ago. Um, and uh, I gotta, I gotta look up the dates to to verify. Everything. But he was the White House correspondent. Yeah, he was the White House uh, correspondent for a while. Yeah, they now. gave him the boot. You see, they're shutting down their airport network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. CNN airport is gone. Yes. They're just because without Trump, they're in panic. Yeah. And you know, Jeff Zucker, the president of CNN, was like, you know, it's the it's the lack of air travel from you know because of COVID mm -mm. and the changing way people are consuming media. And I'm like, yeah, but what about CNN hotels? Like hotels play CNN all the time. But I guess they were paying the airports. So that makes sense that they would terminate that. I wonder what the airports are going to do. Oh no. They're just going to leave CNN on. I think that's actually a bet CNN probably made. I mean, they, they have all these TVs at the airports. The airports aren't going to just turn them off. They're going to have to play something. Wasn't there rumors about Zucker potentially leaving CNN too recently? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Okay. The, the whole ecosystem, the whole economic system of the media was built on Donald Trump for four years. That's why I've been saying before the media secretly wants Trump to win, but they can't say it or contribute to it. But deep down, they're like, what am I going to do? Like there's an op-ed from one journalist freaking out being like, my whole career was built on calling out Trump and now he's gone. What do I do? And it was like some other journalist talking them down, like, calm down, calm down. <laughs> you'll figure it out. You'll, you'll evolve from this. I, I was surprised to see the Krasenstein brothers uh, celebrating uh, in a short video. If, if you don't know, they're, they're two guys who, the only people, the only reason anyone knows their name is because they were Trump reply guys on Twitter. They got their following through re responding to Donald Trump. And they were celebrating him getting banned. Well, you know, that's how you, that's how people know who you are. Uh, but this whole thing about corporate corporations, banks cutting off Trump, social media companies cutting off Trump, it's kind of has a silver lining in a way because it shows where power lies in America, and it's raised this issue now. I think to international concern. You got foreign leaders who are horrified yeah. to see. I was I was really uh, um, uh, what's what's the right word. Uh, not shocked. I was impressed, you know, uh, to, to see bastions of human rights and civil liberties standing up just give, gave me hope, you know, like like uh, uh, China and uh, Uganda <laughs> uh -huh. calling out these these horrific acts that were being carried out in the United States. Hmm, bravo. Well, one thing that's really interesting is that there is uh, international outrage about what's happening in the United States with the banning of the U.S. president on social media, kind of transferring the power of information into the small hands of a few select billionaires. And it's uh, a few French ministers, Angela Merkel, uh, the Mexican president, and, and a lot of other people are actually... Aus Australian ministers yeah. as well, and there are reports that the British prime minister is now considering... Uh, regulations yeah. on tech censorship now this really? is interesting yeah. Wow. yeah this is interesting because we don't hear about this at all like the, the, there's no outcry there's celebration on social media that were shown on mainstream media which calls for more heads to roll uh but but we don't hear any of the legitimate concerns that are are very serious i mean we, we're living in a situation where essentially a few people have total control they privatized the, the internet and they could do whatever they want with this vast ever-growing power that has so much influence on our lives and it's absolutely scary People outside of the U.S. are realizing it, and no one's even hearing about it. Yeah. So American elites love the fact that these tech companies can stamp down on their political opponents, but uh, no one in any other country really likes the idea of that because they don't want an Ameri <laughs> they don't want an American company coming and picking and choosing their elected leaders. Mm -hmm. That's like where the, we're going. The Chancellor of Germany doesn't want that. The Prime Minister of Britain doesn't want that. Yeah. The dictator of Uganda doesn't want that. He just banned well, Twitter and Facebook before his election. Well, they understand this kind of bigger merger of big tech and the Biden administration that's hiring all these tech executives to be a part of its government. This merger is going to have vast power, not just in the United States, but specifically the world. Whenever there's a protest, whenever there's a demonstration, whenever there's a world leader that doesn't play along, that doesn't do whatever the elites want him to do, whatever the billionaire class wants done, if, if they don't do it, if they don't jump when they say jump, they're going to have all the power in the world to shut someone down everywhere because of their speech. And and, and we, we have to understand, this is not just Twitter or Facebook. These are monopoly powers of, of Amazon and Google that control the key infrastructures of our information highways. So whether it's server space, whether it's internet cables, these people have so much power way beyond just social media algorithms. So it's interesting, Poland, they announced this bill. I don't know if you, know if you guys saw this, yes. where they're going to you know, reign in big tech. I actually have this, uh, this story from the New York Post written by Will Chamberlain. He writes, Poland, appropriately enough, is leading the way. 
Their Justice Minister Zygmunt Ziobro announced last month that the Polish government would enact a law constraining big tech from censoring their citizens. Polish users who are victims of censorship can go to a new Polish court, get an injunction forcing the company to restore their account and their content on penalty of a fine of as much as 1.8 million euro. We should do the same. Americans should have the same right to speak on large social media platforms that they do in a public park. We simply need to change the law to make that a reality. You know what I love the most about this? Here I am, you know, 10 years ago, uh, fundraising and doing, you know, engaging in activism to regulate major corporations. Why? Oil spills, Mm -hmm. big political lobbying, violation of civil liberties. And, you know, you you had these big evil companies. And here I am today doing the exact same thing. Isn't that weird? Yet now conservatives have joined in. And it's really interesting to see the left has abandoned me. Where'd they go? Yes. They no longer want to regulate the companies that are seizing the commons. I, d- I made an analogy to this on Twitter where I said, I, I had an epiphany after being told, but my private company for the 500 millionth time. And I realized that all the activism I did for the environment was wrong. BP is a private company. If they, want, if, they have the, if they build an oil rig in the ocean and they're permitted to do it and oil spills out of it, well, too bad. Why don't you start a company to clean up that oil? And I know, of course, they all said, that's a different thing. It's a different problem. That doesn't make sense. And I said, it certainly makes sense. BP caused damage to the commons, the areas that we all share that must be protected so that people can use them. In that destruction and damage, we all got mad. And there are regulations to pre- prevent them from doing this. What I see with big tech and social media is them shutting down legal political speech in the commons where we have our, they've, they've taken over the town square. People aren't going out and going to church to talk anymore. They're not going to to community centers. They're doing it on Twitter. And the big tech companies shut that down. And I believe they need to be regulated in some capacity. And this sounds like a good solution. Allow people to get an injunction. Well, this latest news definitely made me feel more Polish and proud from my home country. But we have to understand Europe has been taking a very different approach than the United States when it comes to big tech for a long time. When it comes to regulations, fines and penalties, social media has been kind of pushed back there more than I would say anywhere else in the world. But also specifically with with Poland and and other countries like Hungary. I also recently saw an article saying that the Biden administration is eyeing Poland and Hungary to get back at it for some of the kind of close relations that they had previously with Donald Trump and because of their implementation of policies that don't go along with, of course, the the kind of global order that some people want to push. The global reset, immigration, uh, you know, nationalism. Those are key important issues that Poland and Hungary hold close to their heart that, of course, is different than the rest of Europe. And that's why we're seeing uh, the Biden administration kind of set its eyes on that specific region because they're going to be implementing policies that are going to affect it in very negative ways. And you especially see this with Hungary, where you had the State Department actually funding opposition media in Hungary. The reason why they particularly dislike that country is because Hungary is trying to get the NGOs out of the country. The NGOs are, of course arms of U.S. influence abroad. They're all funded by USAID or the State Department. Didn't they ban Soros? They banned the Soros NGOs. Yes, it was quite a while ago. You know, it's interesting. I think you were telling me something, Luke, because uh, I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a very Polish neighborhood. And of course, there's always the stereotype about Polish people not being smart. You mentioned that it was because the Soviet Union executed the intelligentsia of Poland. Yes. Well, Well, when Russia came in, they, they took a lot of the professionals, whether doctors, whether professors, teachers, and they executed a lot of them or sent some of them to Siberia in order to gain cultural control of larger institutions that they were able to implement communism that the Polish people hated and they resisted. And and that's one of the reasons why this kind of labeling by the Russians as Poles as being stupid uh, is kind of prevalent. But also, if you look at it, Polish people actually have a very high IQ, especially compared to that region. Uh, but but specifically, uh, it, it didn't work. But but another thing I want to bring up, because I saw a tweet, I, I don't know exactly who said this, but it was by a left-wing verified user talking about how he wants to make sure that Trump supporters can't ever be teachers, yep. uh, professors, uh, and any kind of workers that have, uh, any kind of work that has kind of um, po- powers to be a boss. Or to influence young yes. I don't know the exact tweet, so I don't want to mention it. Uh, you know, directly, but but we're seeing kind of similar epithets being issued by blue check mark verified Twitter users that are worrying and that do echo some other historical uh, timelines well, that are troublesome. And, and John Brennan saying that no no one who served in the Trump administration should ever get a job anywhere else. It reminds me of uh, 
uh, debathification in Iraq, where yes. any, anyone who yep. was part of the bath party, yep. can't, you can't let them do anything. They're well, excluded I, from society. Well, hold on, just and it's really the same people point. doing it. That's literally what we were talking about yesterday that brought onto the onset of ISIS. That was one of the key moves, according to many strategists, that brought ISIS to the national stage was that particular move that you brought up. Sorry, go ahead, Tim. No, I was going to say, I, th I think the, 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 the thing you were saying about Poland is really interesting because, yeah, they wanted to get rid of the, intelligent, the, the intelligentsia, the thought leaders, the cultural leaders in Poland. And we're seeing a similar thing with mass censorship. They want to take out the influential people of you know, right-wing populism. And at the same time, what you see with Poland is a deep hatred for communism and uh, fascism or Nazism because they were oppressed by both. So now you have this country that's like, we're going to defend the right of our citizens because we know exactly what it leads to, regardless of your le if you're left wing or right wing. Yeah. I yeah. remember seeing a meme recently and it said dangerous tools of uh, insurrection and it had uh, a guitar and it had a paintbrush. And, and we have to understand here, the, the bigger cultural aspects and institutions are pretty much more and more political for a reason. And they're extorting a lot of that power, a lot of that kind of culture, a lot of that kind of influence in, in ways that really should make people question what's really going on here. I but you, you can tell how the tech companies really messed up because it's not just Poland and Hungary who have been opposed to internet censorship for a while, and Poland was working on this before the Trump bans, uh, so was Hungary. But it's also alarmed Germany and France yep. and the UK and Australia because, you know, all of those countries, you know, they're run by fairly, you know, neoliberal or left-wing governments, uh, especially Germany, and they have hate speech laws on the books. Uh, but they look at what Silicon Valley is doing and, and, and are thinking, well, hold on, it's our job to define what hate speech is. Yep. That's a job of our national parliaments, our governments. We're not going to have Silicon Valley yep. come in and set the rules for us. Yeah, many people don't understand in large parts of Europe, if you utter some words together, you literally will end up in jail. There's people who just said particular sounds, they are in jail. We in the United States have an amazing uh, a right that's inherent for I think everyone to be able to exercise our free speech but again that is directly under threat right now with all the major avenues of communication squashing down and making sure people can't have a voice online well this, this is an interesting question because is it are the government consequences worse now than the corporate consequences in America so at least in the in Europe you know when the state defines hate speech that's governed by some form of parliamentary procedure. It's, there's a democratic process. It's transparent. They can't just change it overnight. And they can't apply it arbitrarily. It has to apply to everyone according to the law. Whereas and there's Silicon accountability in a court yes. proceeding that happens. Sorry, go in ahead. Indeed. And uh, whereas Silicon Valley, they can change it overnight. They can apply it to just to one set of people and not to another. Uh, and uh, the consequences can potentially be more severe. You could lose your entire livelihood, your entire business. Whereas in Europe, mostly you might get a fine. Uh, it was Count Dankula, right, who got like an 800 pound fine. Mm. Is that yeah. worse than being demonetized and by YouTube? I think he, being demonetized is worse, But right? follow, following the arrest and the smears, he did get that as well. You know, it was it was an arrest. It was a charge. It was, you know, criminal trial. And, and then Silicon Valley piles on. Ex well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I'll tell you what's scarier than Twitter banning someone. What's scary is banks banning people or vendors banning people. What we're seeing now is, is one of the most, dis uh, look, I'll say the word dystopian, nightmarish, all that stuff. But let me just stress this point. We are, at, we, are, we are in this space now where almost every corporation is terrified of everyone walking in lockstep and banning any wrong thinker. It doesn't matter if there's a government doing it. It isn't, there, there's no, this is, this, this is scarier. There's no head to this hydra or, or the snake. It is literally a, a chicken with no head running around freaking out. And so you'll get, so uh, there, was, there was a tweet where some guy uh, was applying for a company. They found out that he, he was a Trump supporter and he had actively supported Trump, you know, quite heavily. So they were just like, they fired him. That's where we're headed. We're headed to where the company will say something like, look, man, I honestly, I voted for the guy, but you know, the, the activists, so we, we can't hi hire you. And then you see what happens to Parler. What, you, see, you see what the CEO of Parler just said? He doesn't think Parler's coming back. It may, it may never return. Wow. Yep. Because no one will work with them. And the left says, see, the free market. I'm like, it's a really good yeah. point about the problems of a free market in that there could be a, an ideology behind whether or not anyone would do business with you. I mean, I would argue, I guess, philosophically, a free market is free from over overarching ideologies that would Im you know, impede or shut down. But where we're at now, it is worse. It is the Mexican standoff of cancel culture. Every single person now, whether they like it or not, are, are scared about what will happen. There are companies that I know 
or I should say, I have, I have friends who are associated with certain companies. They like Trump or they love Trump or they're neutral and don't care. But they all recognize if anyone finds out, we'll lose everything. Why? Because everyone is scared of everyone else. No one knows who's going to be the person to raise the pitchfork. Why are you scared of these people? The only way that stops is if people say, I don't care. You can yell on the internet, so what? Mm. I mean, John Stewart Mill talked about the tyranny of the majority where uh, everyone sort of behaves in a way and, you know, clamps down on tyranny. But this is less tyranny of the majority because I think if you ask the majority of people, do you think, uh, you know, people who support Trump should be able to have jobs? I mean, I think most people would agree with that. This is a kind of, it's tyranny of herd behavior right. of a very specific group of people who are in power and all believe this. But it's a very small group of people who just happen to be running all the corporations. Yeah. It, it, is, it is people scared of being called a racist. And so they're like, but if I serve this person, then they'll call me a racist. So what? God, just grow up, man. I can't believe that there are businesses that were like, we can't do, we can't work with you, Parler. We're scared. Yeah, that's pathetic. And you know what? This is on conservatives too. You have to vote with your dollars. Do not support anybody who would bow and bend to this herd, uh, uh, you know, what, what did you call it? Herd tyranny? Yeah, tyranny of the herd. Tyranny herd of the herd. Herd behavior. Right. We can't, we, we, we can't do this. If someone's going to bend the knee to a bunch of screaming people, then we're not going to be able to function. All right. So you, you need to be able to run your business and stand up for what you believe in. And you know what the problem is? I think Republicans, the political party, is a spineless mess of, there's, it's, I'm sorry, spineless is not fair. It's a bowl of spaghetti. It's a bunch of wet noodles flopping around in Congress who for years knew this problem existed. And you know what I said in 2018? I said Republicans are too stupid to know, you know, to solve, to, they're too stupid to address the problem of big tech censorship. And that's the politicians. There are some people who have consistently brought, Republicans who have brought forth bills challenging this, calling out big tech, my respect to them. But most of them have just been flopping around like wet noodles, doing whatever they're told. Then you end up with someone like Jared Kushner. Brad Parscale tells Donald Trump, get on Parler, get on a different platform. And then Trump says, what do you think to Jared? And Kushner goes, nah, don't do it. And Trump goes, okay. And now here you are. Now, hold on. Trump's lucky. Because while he may not have had the understanding or experience to actually solve this and was getting bad advice from people like Kushner, other people saw it coming. And lo and behold, Gab.com has archived and backed up the real Donald Trump account, verified 1.2 million followers, and all of his tweets up until the point. I think there's some tweets that are missing, but for the most part, his entire account is here with videos and statements. And at any point, Trump could just use it. Now, my question is right now, why isn't Trump using it? Why doesn't he still just go on, use Gab? Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Well, they, he'd overloaded the site for sure because they're using they have their own infrastructure. But at, at a certain point, Trump should just, okay, I'll use whatever platform I can. He's one of those stupid Republicans, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think Trump's old. And he's and, and I don't even know if he had, there, there, Actually, I'll tell you this. There was a uh, Donald Trump schedule post went out. I don't know if it was real. But it said something like, Trump is going to be working very, very hard. He'll be working all day, working very hard. And people oh, were have like, it, having many meetings and yes. many phone calls. And people are like, did Trump write this? <laughs> like, it sounds just <laughs> like he wrote it. You, know, did, you saw that. I did, so, yeah. So maybe it's just that he doesn't have any advice anymore. And he's just not talking to anybody. And he's sitting around like, I don't know. Was it written in Sharpie? <laughs> well, it was, was, it was him. And we'll have uh, many, many meetings but, and phone calls. But, but this, is, this is great what, what, what Gab did, because even if you don't like the president or if you like the president, this is an important historical record where major events unfolded on that Twitter account that are historically relevant. So, I mean, the bigger question that you, you kind of mentioned here, what's stopping him? I don't think anything should be. I think he should be using any kind of platform that promotes he, uh, look, free speech. He just did this, this statement saying like no violence and, and all that. But he also said, I want to call out the, the, the big tech censorship. Well, bro, just go get on. A, get on Gab. Yeah, go yeah. on Gab. Yeah, get on Gab. There you go. I mean, there, there needs to be industry-wide reform to a number of industries, including banking, including credit cards, including big tech, because you can't have the situation where you've got a two-tiered society where some people have access to the economy and some people don't. But I will say Gab.com is the one example of build your own actually working. Because they had many, many challenges. They lost their web host. They lost, lost their DNS registrar. But they overcame all that. They built their own servers. They're building their own phones. And that, they're building their own phones. They built their own <laughs> web browser. Servers, uh, yeah. I mean, they're having trouble handling the traffic right now. They've got a huge surge. They're build, uh, bringing more servers online. But, you know, they're still up and running. They haven't taken them out. Although I will say, just today, we're seeing that, that now the desperation 
of uh, the people who don't want internet freedom. The Anti-Defamation League mm. has petitioned the, uh, the Justice Department to launch a criminal investigation into Gab really? for hosting violent content. Well, there you go. See, now they're trying to get into the criminal realm, but we got a constitution. We'll yeah. see how that plays out. Thanks for checking out this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. We do the show live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. So come back to check us out when we go live. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, hit the notification bell. And we are also available on all podcast platforms for free. If you want to listen to us there, thanks for hanging out and we will see you all next time.